All right, let's get started. Uh, tonight, we're joined by our presenter, Ben Diedrich. Uh, he's done a few different workshops for us, including the uh, state planning workshops. Uh, he'll be sharing many years of experience uh, in the uh, legal industry. Uh, and uh, tonight, he'll bring us some info about uh, intellectual property, protecting your assets um, in, for your business and your creative assets. Uh, ben, if you want to take it away, on behalf of Frontway Credit Union, we just thank you for being with us, Ben, and uh, thank you those in attendance. I know it looks like we have one person in the room with us. So Dell, uh, 3003, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to unmute yourself. Uh, typically, we don't do that just so Ben can get through the, um, the uh, presentation, but you know, since you're here, you can steer us how, how you want and ask Ben some questions directly. Thank you, Ben. All right, Kellen. Thank you for having me. Definitely. Uh, always appreciate my time working with Front Wave. And yeah, you know, when we would do this in the pre-COVID era and we would be doing it in person, I always enjoyed and encouraged the back and forth asking questions as we're going along. So um, if anybody on the line would like to jump in at any point and ask their questions, let's do that. All right, so without further ado, I'll get started. So tonight we are, we're gonna talk about basically the basics of intellectual property. What is intellectual property? Um, what's the difference between a patent, a trademark and a copyright? And you know, for the business owners, why should I care about IP at all? Let's move on. So a little bit about me, just so you know, you know why, are, why are we listening to this guy? What does he know, <laughs> right? So, uh, I, my background is in actually molecular biology. I have a degree in molecular biology. Um, I worked in the biotech industry for several years. I became a registered patent agent in front of the United States Patent Office back in 2003. So I've been working in the patent intellectual property area for a, almost 20 years now at this point. Uh, I went, I already had my patent registration with the patent office, and then I decided to go to law school to become a patent attorney, went to USC for law school, joined an IP boutique firm where I was at for over a decade, uh, where all we focused on was intellectual property, and then back in 2016, so almost six years ago now at this point, it'll be six years of the summer, uh, started my own practice where we only do two things intellectual property, and then Kellen, like you mentioned, the estate planning, that's all we do. So I talked about it here, yeah, this is us, this is our firm, and like I said, we focus on two things, intellectual property and estate planning. So let's talk about IP, right? So IP is actually a huge part of today's global economy, right? So there's valuable IP rights and assets and everything we see around us, everything we buy, consume, use every day is full of IP that's owned by businesses, right? So tonight we're gonna to talk about, you know, what are the main types of intellectual property and talk about how they might be protected. And then we're gonna talk for the business owners, we're gonna talk about best practices for protecting your IP rights. And also just as importantly, uh, best practices to avoid infringing other people's IP rights so we don't get in trouble there. So let's talk about with the, let's start foundationally with the basics, right? Let's talk about the different types of property. I can't tell you how many times at a mixer or a cocktail party where I tell people that I do intellectual property and they think I'm, I'm doing real estate, right? And so <laughs> let's talk about the different types of property. So real property, is real estate, right? So that's things like the businesses, headquarters, their parking lot, the land they own, the buildings they own, that's real property. Then there's personal property. That's everything basically contained within the building, right? So it's their office equipment, their computers, their furniture, things like that. Those are kind of the property items that a business might own that we can see and touch. And then what I focus on is the intellectual property. So this is information, technology, branding, uh, artistic creations that a company might come up with. That's what's called intellectual property. And as you know, as we move forward in this world, in this society, the intellectual property can actually be a larger and larger asset on the company's books um, and actually you know, far surpass their physical real property or personal property assets. So we're gonna talk about the different types of intellectual property protection. So there's 
there's basically four main types of intellectual property and we'll talk about each of them but um, the most common of those four are starting with patents right so patents cover inventions new machines new processes you know improved mouse traps those are covered by patents copyrights cover anything that's an artistic work so art dance literature movies things like that are covered by copyright protection the other main type of intellectual property is trademarks right so trademarks cover branding um, product identifiers company identifiers logos package designs things like that the way that you recognize a product coming from one company versus another those are trademarks and those are all of those things can be registered and they kind of they're facing to the public the public sees them uses them and then there's this one other area of intellectual property this fourth area it's kind of off to the side it's different completely opposite from those three and that's trade secrets and so you know i said the other three are kind of out public facing people see them trade secrets are what companies keep secret to themselves and there's economic value by keeping it a secret so this can be you know your business plans your customer lists um you know kind of the most famous that people would know is you know the coca-cola recipe or kfc's recipe those are all kept as trade secrets and they have value because nobody else knows what they are those are the four main types of intellectual property but there's also some other areas that can be covered and have value right so things like your domain names your websites that you own here in california with hollywood rights of publicity for famous people this is another big area out here in california social media accounts right so having having your facebook page your twitter account your instagram account actually tied to your company and your brand that has value as well and then you know there are different types of products that can actually fall into multiple categories that might be covered by more than one or all the different types of intellectual property so for example software right so new software might have potentially patentable ideas right so brand new ideas a new way of doing something that's covered in that software they might also have trade secrets right so there's something that you do in there that you and you hide your code so that other people can't reverse engineer it can't see it and you might hold that as a trade secret the actual code that is available to view that could be copyrighted that you know the way that a programmer codes the software is an artistic expression that might be covered by copyright. And then the name of the software that you're selling to people that could be a trademark right so things like software could actually encompass all four of those large areas of intellectual property. And again any questions feel free to jump in and ask it as you know would love to make this interactive if that works for everybody. So next topic is why does IP matter, right? Um, well, as I already hinted at before, it matters because it can be one of a company's most valuable assets, right? So a lot of tech startup companies, things like that. I mean, the intellectual property is the value of their business. Uh, what it can do is it can build your brand awareness, loyalty with your customers. Um, it establishes protectable legal interests in those goods and services provided by the company and their technology, right? So it's something that the business can claim as theirs. And because of that, it has intrinsic value. Those intellectual property rights separate from the company can be sold, licensed, or leveraged for profit, right? You can get, you can get loans on them, you can get liens against them, right? So they have actual intrinsic value, even though we can't see and touch them necessarily. Another reason why IP matters on the opposite side is because, and I see this all the time, if we ignore other people's intellectual property rights, we can get into big, big trouble, right? So we can be forced to rebrand if we're using, uh, uh, if we're branding our company in a way that might be too close to someone else's, we might be forced to rebrand. We might be forced to give up our profits we've made because we're, too, we're infringing on somebody else's intellectual property. Um, there's statutory damages that might be at stake where we have to pay damages for infringing their intellectual property, even if we didn't make any profits ourselves. We can be forced to stop selling our product, right? Um, there's lots of huge ramifications that we get into by just not thinking about other people's IP. And our lack of awareness doesn't stop the liability, right? So just because we can say, I didn't know they had this IP, I'm sorry, 
that doesn't undo these effects, right? And we could still pay large amounts of money because of IP that we weren't aware of. So, let, you know, patents and copyrights kind of go together. In my mind, they kind of go together. So they actually originate from the U.S. Constitution here in the U.S., right? So they go back to the Constitution. The Constitution talks about giving exclusive monopolies to inventors for, with patents and to artistic creators with copyrights, right? So normally governments don't like monopolies, right? Normally we try to stop monopolies. We want consumers to have choices and availability. Um, but they understood the, the value of getting new inventions out into the world, of getting artistic creations out into the world. And so kind of to incentivize that, we will grant a limited term monopoly by a patent or a copyright so that that encourages that disclosure of these inventions or artistic works out into the world. And then in exchange, when that time period runs, then they're open, they're public domain, they're open for the world to use. They're, they've been disclosed and now the world can use them. Let's talk about, you know, kind of the main focus for me at least is patents. So let's talk about patents. So when we talk about patents, most people are thinking about what's called utility patents. So this covers inventions, right? The improved mousetrap. And so on the screen here, you can see, you know, what's eligible to be patented. So it can be processes, it can be machines, it can be articles of manufacture, which means things made, right? Things that are produced by machines or by hand. Uh, it can be compositions of matter. So it can be new chemicals, new formulas, and it can be improvements to any of the above. And as we go on with time, you know, really that's what most patents are nowadays. They're improvements on things that have come in the past. So that leaves the question, what's not eligible to be patented, right? So laws of nature, physical phenomena, abstract ideas can't be patented, right? So Einstein's famous formula, E equals MC squared, right? That itself can't be patented. The idea of E equals MC squared could not be patented. But if we take that formula and we create a nuclear reactor that creates energy for us to use, that creation, that utilization of E equals MC squared, that could be patented, right? So it's the actual utilization that could be patented. So in order to get a utility patent, there are three requirements that have to be met in order for an inventor to get a patent on their invention. The first one is it has to have what's called utility, meaning it has to do something useful. It has to actually have a beneficial purpose and actually achieve a result. This is, you know, a pretty easy hurdle to overcome. Um, <laughs> we're not really usually looking at to filing things if they don't have utility. Um, historically, this was in place to kind of prevent patents being issued on inventions that would violate, you know, the laws of thermodynamics or something like that, where, you know, perpetual motion machines that wouldn't actually be able to be built. That was kind of the idea behind it. In recent time, this utility requirement has come in and has been used to block more and more types of inventions. So really it came up almost a decade ago now um, where it's made software-based patents, business method type patents, much more difficult to obtain because they're saying under Supreme Court jurisprudence now, they're saying that those don't have utility and they don't meet this utility requirement. Another area where that's been an issue is in my field, biotechnology, is, you know, <clears throat> there was a big, big case where somebody was trying to patent the breast cancer gene, the actual gene itself. And the Supreme Court ruled that that also didn't meet this utility requirement because it was a naturally, naturally occurring phenomenon. We weren't, man isn't creating the genes. The genes are inherent in nature and therefore not patentable. A test for that gene, that would be patentable, but the gene itself is not patentable. And that's based under this utility requirement. The second requirement in order to get a patent is what's called novelty. And by novelty, what we're saying is that your invention can never have been done exactly the same way that you're proposing anywhere in the world prior to you, okay? Prior to you filing your patent application. So, 
what that means is that anybody else who came up with that same idea, the same exact idea before you, that would block you from getting a patent. And your own <laughs> use of that idea before you file a patent application could actually block you, okay? So with patents, you actually have to file your patent application before you have any public disclosure of your invention. So if you go to a trade show and you talk about it, or if you publish an article about it, or if you sell one or offer to sell one to somebody before you file your patent application, you lose your rights because now it's no longer novel because even though it was you, you introduced it into the world before you filed for your patent application and it's considered to no longer be novel. The rest of the world, they're strict. That's the, the, you have your patent application on file before that first disclosure or you lose your rights. The US is a little more lenient and they give you a one year grace period. So based on your first disclosure, you have up until one year from that first disclosure to get a patent application on file before you lose your rights. But you've lost rights in every other country other than the US by doing that. Um, there's what's called a provisional patent application and I'll talk about that a little bit later on but that can be used to get something on file before you make your first disclosure. And that might give you, that might make you so you don't lose your foreign rights by having that provisional application on file before you disclose. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later. And now we get to the third requirement in order to get a patent and it's what's called non-obviousness. <laughs> so what it means is that your invention can't be a quote unquote, obvious derivation from what's come in the past, right? So you can't just take something that's already been known and make a, you know, a minor little change to it and then claim that minor change as being your invention, right? So it has to be something more substantial than what would be obvious to someone working in the field. So something like, you know, changing what a piece is made out of, you know, changing it from metal to plastic because plastic is cheaper, easier to make, lighter, um, that wouldn't be enough to get a patent on it just by making that change. That's what's considered to be, you know, merely an engineering change and not an actual invention. And so this is where the vast majority of patent applications get hooked up, right? This is where they fail to meet the requirements to be patentable. Because usually, usually it's going to be useful. It's going to do something or we're not going to file an application. Usually we're pretty aware of whether it's novel or not, right? We know what's out there and we don't file an application if someone's done the exact same thing before. So this is where most applications get caught and get rejected is over this obviousness issue. So now I talked about how the US was a little more lenient and gave you one year from your first disclosure to file an application, unlike the rest of the world. Another thing that the US used to do different from the rest of the world is we used to be a first to invent system, meaning whoever invented first would get the patent, regardless of who made it to the patent office first. The rest of the world has been almost always a first to file system. So it's whoever got to the patent office first, they win and they get the patent. Back in 2013, so almost a decade ago now, the US joined the rest of the world and switched to a first to file system. So we do have that race to the patent office now, even though we still do have that one year grace period that the rest of the world doesn't have. So those are utility patents. Again, those are what most people think of when they think of patents. There are you know, a few other types of patents that are out there. I hinted a little bit earlier about these provisional patent applications. And then there's, you know, and I've, I haven't talked about it in detail, but we've, I've kind of <laughs> skirted around the issue is that patents are on a country by country basis, right? So we've been talking about United States patents here, but if you wanted protection in other countries, you would have to file in each country you wanted protection in. There's no such thing as a global patent that covers the world, right? And so we have to pick and choose which countries we want to get protection in. And so there is what's called a patent cooperation treaty. There's a treaty that most of the countries in the world have entered into that um, has some benefits, but it's still not a global patent. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then finally, there's design patents that cover the way something looks rather than its usefulness. So provisional patent applications, they're never examined. Unlike a utility application, they're never actually examined. 
they just get filed. They sit on a shelf at the patent office and they give you up to one year to file your full application. So the reason why these exist here in the US and only here in the US is kind of to give, you know, a little bit of a benefit to the small time inventor, right? So they're, they have less formalities, they're easier to file um, and they give you some time so you can file that provisional application and then you have one year to file your actual real full application. So that gives you that one year to further develop your idea, maybe to seek out funding or start selling them, try to get a profit so that you can afford to go through the full application process. And that's kind of a unique feature of the US system that the rest of the world doesn't have. These PCT, these international PCT applications, right? So when I talked about filing in each country that you wanna go into, there's, again, most countries have entered into a treaty where you have one year from your first filing to file in whatever foreign countries you want to go into. So again, if you file your US application, whether it's a provisional or a full application, that would give you then one year to choose which foreign countries you want to go into. And it can, you know, you could see, I'm sure you could picture, it starts stacking up pretty quickly, the expenses there, right? And so you have one year to get those applications on file. So while there is no such thing as a global patent, there are these PCT applications that basically, similar to a provisional, they just kick down the road when the expenses come in. So rather than you having one year from your first filing to choose which countries you wanna go into, you now have 30 months. So you buy an extra 18 months before you have to decide which countries you go into. So you still have to eventually, at some point, 30 months, choose which countries and pay to go into each of those countries individually. But it gives you more time, again, to secure funding, to see if it's a market that's actually going to work, whether the product is going to give you a return or not. And then so then you can choose to go into whichever countries you choose to at that point. If you go this route, it does cost you more in the long run because you have to pay for this application here and then you still pay for each country when you go in. But again, it just defers those expenses. And then finally, there's design patents. So what we've been talking about before, those are all utility patents. Those all cover the, you know, the use, useful function of a new invention design patents and, and instead they cover the ornamental aspect of an invention right so the non-functional parts just the way that it looks and so it looks that way because you thought it looked good to make it that way not because it actually serves some purpose by looking that way and so we can protect that that way that it looks the way that a product looks by way of a design patent it's a little, it's, they're usually faster to get, easier to get, cheaper to get. Um, but again, they just cover the particular way that your product looks. So if someone else wanted to make a product that did the same thing, but they made it look a little bit different, they would not be infringing your design patent. So whenever somebody has an invention and they want to see whether it makes sense to go forward with patenting, I always recommend they start doing some searching on their own first to see what's out there, right? If you come across something that's identical to yours or very close to yours, then you know, okay, maybe there's a novelty issue here and there's no point in pursuing it, right? And so the United States Patent Office, the website's on the screen there, they have a fully searchable database all the way back to, like I said, back to when the constitution was started, right? So you can search through all those patents. The problem with the United States Patent Office's website is it's not super user friendly, right? So it's very difficult to search through it. So Google, as they do, stepped in and they have a fully searchable that uses the same library as the USPTO, but it's much more searchable like you would expect from Google. So that's where I recommend most people go start their search is at patents.google.com is a great way to see what's out there before you spend too much time and energy and money going forward. So why get a patent, right? So <laughs> I've, I've hinted already that they're kind of expensive, kind of hard to get. So why would I even bother with it, right? So the benefits of a patent is it gives you these rights here on the screen. It, make, it allows you to stop other people from making your product, using your product, selling your product, 
or importing your product into the country so long as your patent is alive, right? So it's pretty powerful that you can force everybody else to not be in this market with you during the life of your patent. So I said life of the patent, right? So how long does a patent last? So I talked about before, right? It's a trade-off. You get this limited monopoly, but in exchange at the end of the life of the patent, it's free for everybody to use. So the utility patents, they last 20 years from the date you file your first application. So it's a 20 year time period. The longer it takes to go through the examination process, the less actual useful time you have on your patent. Design patents, the way that something looks, right? Those last 15 years from the date it issues. So it's, it's a different start point um, and it's 15 years. So it's a shorter time period, but it's a different start point. Those provisionals I talked about, again, they're never actually examined. They just give you one year to file your full application. And then those international PCTs, again, they give you 30 months before you choose which countries you wanna go into. So again, you know, I do this presentation for lots of different um, people, different groups, right? And where they come from. I do it for colleges, universities. I do it for businesses, right? And so everybody has different interests in what they wanna spend time on. But for businesses, right? And a big deal is the patent damages, right? What, what kind of damages can I recover if someone's infringing on my patent? So patents don't have any statutory damages. There's nothing written in law as to what damages have to be paid. So instead, what the damage calculation is, if you go through a trial and they're determined to be infringing your patent, is you get paid either your lost profits because they were in the marketplace or, quote unquote, a reasonable royalty, right? So if you, the two of you have been negotiating at arm's length and agreed to a license agreement for them to sell, what would they have paid you in exchange for that? So those are the damages you would get paid. Um, you know, there's a statute of limitations time period. It only works for up to six years prior to you filing your suit. There's issues if it's willful infringement, if they knew of your patent and they chose to infringe it anyways, they can get, you can get triple damages, right? So whatever, those damages were found to be, now we'll triple them. So there's, you know, we, the largest lawsuits in the country um, are patent infringement cases, right? The largest dollar amounts are for patent infringement cases. We can get up to huge amounts of money in these infringement cases. So some final words on patents. So for business owners, what action steps can we take now in regard to patents? So the main things are, you know, have an internal policy in place for your employees to disclose inventions as they come up with them, right? So have a system where if they think this might be an invention, have a form they fill out and submit to their manager or something like that to have reviewed to see whether it's something that would be worthwhile to pursue for patent protection. And then most importantly is make sure you file a patent application before you make any public disclosure. Otherwise, you're going to lose any foreign rights you might have and potentially your rights here in the US. So that's my summary on patents. Um, let's move on now to copyrights then. So copyrights, again, cover anything in the artistic field. So they're, quote unquote, original works of authorship. So they have to be something you created and they have to be this is a legal phrase here, fixed in any tangible form of expression. So they have to actually, pen has to go to paper, right? They have to be in a physical form in order to get copyrights, right? So if I'm walking down the street singing a song that I wrote or created, that there's no copyright in that because it's not in a physical form. If somebody recorded me doing that, now there's a copyright in it because there's a physical form. Right, so it has to be put down in physical form. Physical doesn't necessarily mean pen and paper anymore, right? It can be you typing the words onto your computer and saving it as a file on your computer. That's a tangible form still, even though it's not something that you can hold in your hands, but it's actually been recorded in some form. So copyrights cover a huge range of artistic endeavors, right? So they cover books, 
They cover comic books, they cover sculpture, they cover architecture, they cover dance choreography, they cover plays, musicals, they cover music recordings, movies, animation, video games, right? So anything that's of an artistic nature. I talked about it at the very outset too, you know, software code, right? The way that you code software can be covered by copyright because the idea, if you, if I, hired 10 different programmers and I said, I want an app that does this, those 10 different programmers would program it 10 different ways. And so that's what's copyrightable is the way they chose to write the program would be copyrightable. So I hit this already, right? So <laughs> copyrights cover the artistic expression of an idea, not the idea itself, right? So patents cover the idea, the invention. So I direct a pat, uh, software engineer to write something that does this thing, this thing that they're doing, that would be potentially patentable. The copyright is the expression, the way that that coder chose to write the code, that would be the copyright. So, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> algorithms within the software are not protected by copyright, right? So not the algorithms, but the actual way that they choose to code it is. Algorithms, those could potentially be protected by patents, although harder nowadays, or by keeping it as a trade secret. So what rights are granted by copyrights? So they give you the right to reproduce it, right? So to make copies of it, they give you the right to prepare derivative works, meaning kind of like spin-offs of it, right? Changes to it, derivations to it. They give you the right to distribute copies to the public, right? So to give them out to people. Um, and to perform and display publicly, right? So this is a big one that most people don't think of, right? So if you go to your city, say they're putting on a movie in the park, right? And they're playing a movie on a big screen in a park somewhere for their residents to come and watch, right? That is a public performance or display of that movie. And so most people just think you could do that, right? You can't, that would be a violation of the copyright. So those people, the people, the cities that do that, actually have to pay a licensing fee to the copyright owner in order to do that. Another thing that people might experience that is, right, so big fights, right? So boxing or MMA fights at, you know, a sports bar, right? So a sports bar, they pay the pay-per-view fee, and now they have people coming to their bar to watch the pay-per-view. You would think that, okay, they, since the bar paid for that pay-per-view fee, they're good now, right? No, because again, that's a public display of it. And so they have to pay huge licensing fees in order to have the fight shown at their sports bar with the customers coming in and buying beer and food to watch it, right? So these are the rights that are granted by copyrights. Again, just like patents, they have a limited term. And then once that term expires, it's free for everybody to use. The difference with copyrights between copyrights and patents is how much longer the term for copyrights is. So you can see on the screen here, copyrights last for whoever the author was that created it. If it's an individual, it lasts for their life plus 70 more years after they die, right? So it's a huge amount of time. So that gives their children, their grandchildren, the opportunity to make money off of those works that were created, right? So it used to be shorter. And then typically what would happen is that as Mickey Mouse was about to expire and go into public domain, Disney would come lobby Congress and get how long copyrights last extended, right? So that Mickey Mouse would stay out of the public domain. Most recently um, in the last year or so, the original Mickey Mouse who looks very different from the current Mickey Mouse, but the original Mickey Mouse from cartoons was about to expire. Disney did not come in and lobby. So the original, the older version of Mickey Mouse is now in the public domain. So we finally have seemed to maybe have gotten to the longest that copyrights are going to last 70 years after the author's death. So again, I talked about authors, right? So the author, the person who creates the work of art, they're the initial owner of that copyright. They can assign it, they can sell their copyright to somebody else, but it's the author who originally owns it, unless it's what's considered to be a work made for hire. And there's very specific requirements in order for a work to be quote unquote made for hire. So if the first and easiest one to meet is if it's an employee, 
creating that work within the scope of their employment, right? And so if, if you're hiring, if you employ artists, so for example, movies, Disney movies, right? So if you employ artists that are drawing to make these movies, they're your employee, you're paying them to do the drawings, that's their job, then Disney owns the copyright from that's created for it because they're doing their job, what you're paying them to do, therefore Disney owns it. it but it has to be within the scope of their employment, right? So I, I talk about newspapers a lot. It's a kind of a dying industry, but I still talk about it. So if you're a journalist and you're employed by a newspaper, and so your job is to write articles for the newspaper, then that newspaper owns the copyright in those articles you write for them because you're an employee doing your job, they own it. If, however, you were the janitor employed by the newspaper, right? So you are an employee of the newspaper, but say you write a fantastic article and they wanna publish it, right? So you are employed by them, you are their employee, but you're a janitor. That's the scope of your employment is to be a janitor, to clean out the rooms. Therefore, you, the janitor, own that copyright, not the newspaper. And so they would have to buy the copyright from you if they wanted to own it. There's another way that it can be an, a, a work for hire. It's if it's a specifically commissioned work and there's a written agreement saying it's a work made for hire and it falls in one of these eight specific categories of items. In that case, it can be a work made for hire. But if most things don't fall into one of these specific categories. So if you're hiring a graphic designer to create something for you, for your business, which does not fall into one of these categories, even though you might have a work made for hire clause in your agreement, it's not valid, right? So you have to actually have a separate copyright assignment transfer from that graphic designer to your business in order for your business to own that copyright. Most people don't think about that, don't realize that. So it's something, an easy way for people to get trapped. So what are the requirements and the benefits of getting a copyright? So I talked about earlier, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium, right? So it has to be recorded, put down on paper or in your computer somehow. It has to actually be recorded, not just something that's spur of the moment and not recorded. There's, you know, a notice, and I'm sure you've all seen these notices before, you know, at the bottom of the screen when a movie ends, or when you open a piece of software and the first screen that comes up, it's on there, or at the bottom of the first page of a book, it's on there. So it's the copyright notice is, you know, the circled C, the date that the work was created and who the owner of the creator is. So there's no longer a requirement for that notice to be on there for you to not lose your rights but it gives you benefits by doing so. And you don't have to have a copyright registration in order to put that notice on there. You get copyright rights just by creating that work. And so you should always put those copyright notices on any work you create, right? So I should have it at the bottom of this slide here, right? Showing that this is the copyright of my, my creation, right? Your website, your business website should have that copyright notice at the bottom of it. Um, any kind of artistic thing you put out there, you should put that copyright notice on it. You can register your copyrights and there's benefits of doing so. Um, the biggest one is <laughs> even though you have rights as soon as you create it, you can't actually sue someone for infringing until you have a registration. And so the damages won't start until you get that registration. So you're better off to get it earlier rather than just waiting and seeing if you need it. Um, there's benefits to having the registration. It's assumed to be valid. There are statutory damages that are available if you can't prove actual damages. And you can actually record your copyright with um, customs, right? With US customs to stop the import of infringing materials into the country. So there's benefits to having that registration in place. Ben, what, real quick, what would be the cost of uh, registering a uh, copyright? Sure. So let's just talk about the actual filing fee at the copyright office, right? So it's currently it's $65 to file a copyright and they're pretty easy to do, right? So most people for a basic work could actually do it themselves, right? So if you wrote a book and you wanted to get the copyright for it, it's a pretty easy form to fill out and submit in order to get that copyright. So it's, it's something that's relatively cheap. 
it's significantly cheaper than patents or trademarks that we're talking about, right? So it's it's something good. You know, if you're a photographer, you might not register every single photograph you take, right? That might get a little a little time consuming and expensive. But if you're creating a you know a, a new record, right? If you're a musician or a band and you're creating a new album, you should register that. If you're an author and you wrote a new book, you should register that. So action steps that your businesses can take in regard to copyrights. So always place that copyright notice on the bottom of your works. Consider registering important uh, items for you. And for your website and your marketing, in order to not infringe someone else's copyright, right? <laughs> it's always best practice to either create your own, right? So hire a photographer to take your own pictures that you own um, or ensure you have the rights to the content. The reason I bring that up is there are people out there that make a living suing people for copyright infringement, right? <laughs> and so what I mean by that is, so Getty Images is one of the larger ones. There are other players out there too that own many, many, many images. Um, and so when you go and do a Google image search and you find a picture that you like and you say, it's, it's here, it's right here, it's on Google, I'm just gonna copy and paste it and put it into my blog on my business website, right? So I'm writing an article about some subject. I went and did a Google search, found a great image that matches up with that. I copied and pasted it, I should be fine, right? No. That's a copyright violation. And if it's owned by Getty Images or some other organizations that have large content databases, you will get a letter asking for you to pay a significant amount of money for that copyright infringement. And this happens all the time where you, you know, you have an intern or a, I think maybe a newer employee that's handling your social media and they're creating content for you, putting blogs up. They copy and paste this picture in, and now all of a sudden you're your business is on the hook for thousands of dollars for that image that you know an intern put up on a on a page on your website right so something to definitely be aware of so that you don't get into that problem. There are websites that specifically have content that grants rights for you to use them, so you just make sure if you're going to use something from the Internet that you didn't create yourself make sure it has commercial rights attached to it, so that you're free to use that. All right, moving on to trademarks. Now we kind of shift gears, right? So <laughs> patents and copyrights go back to the constitution and they were to incentivize new inventions getting out into the world, new works of art getting out into the world. Trademarks have a different origin and a different policy reason for their existence, right? So trademarks, the policy reason behind it is to protect customers from being confused, okay? So if I go, to the grocery store and I buy Coca-Cola on the shelf, trademark law lets me know that I'm buying actual real Coca-Cola and not something that Joe around the corner made and sold to the grocery store, right? So it's to protect the customers to know what they're getting. And so there's no, there's no social benefit by creating new trademarks, right? There's no social benefit just to having more trademarks in the world like there is for new inventions, for new pieces of art, right? So it's a different policy perspective. It's to protect the customer so that they're not confused. And it can be, you know, any, it's on the screen here, but it can be any word, design, symbol, or any combination that helps to identify your goods from someone else's goods or your services from someone else's services. And there's different ways to get trademark protection, okay? so. Patents, copyrights, those are exclusively federal law, right? So the federal government grants those rights. Again, it goes back to the Constitution, right? So there is no such thing as a state patent or a state copyright. It's all federal law given by the United States federal government. Trademarks, again, they're different, right? So there's different ways to create trademark rights. So the kind of the gold standard, which most people think of, is a federal, a United States federal registration. So when you see a, the circled R after something, that's a United States federal registration, right? So after Coca-Cola, after Disney, after Apple, those circled R's, that's a federal registration. And that covers you to protect you again in the entirety of the US, right? So even if you're, maybe you're only here 
in California, Arizona, and Nevada, right? So your presence is only here. If you get a federal registration, you would be able to stop someone else from using that mark in Florida or New York or whatever, even if you aren't there yet. Then the kind of the next step down is there are state registrations, right? So every state, California included, has state trademark registrations. And so they're more limited in that they only apply to the state that you register them in. But for some people, that's enough, right? Or the federal registrations, they actually require interstate commerce, right? So in order to get a federal registration, you have to be selling across state lines or you can't even get a federal registration. So if you're only selling within the state, then maybe the state registration is good enough for you. And then finally, again, there's no obligation to register your trademarks. So you actually start building up what's called common law rights just from being out in the marketplace, right? So just by offering your products for sale or offering your services under that mark, you create common law rights. They're more limited. They don't have, you know, the benefits of registrations and they're limited to the geographic region that you're actually using the mark. So if you own a brick and mortar store here in Menifee, right? And so you're selling goods to people here in Menifee or you're a restaurant selling food to people here in Menifee, right? You're only gonna get common law rights in your mark for people that are gonna be visiting here in Menifee. So maybe there's a little room for expansion around for people that might come to your to you right from Marietta, Temecula, maybe Riverside, but it's going to be this geographic region. So it's definitely not going to be Northern California. And it's definitely not going to be out of state, right? And so that's kind of the foundational level. You get those rights just by using. So what can a trademark be, right? So trademarks can be lots and lots of different things. They can be names like Calvin Klein or George Foreman for grills. They can be brands, right? Like Coke or Apple. They can be symbols, right? Like the Nike swoosh there or the Adidas three lines. They can be slogans. Uh, I'm dating myself here, but like Wendy's where's the beef, right? <laughs> or a diamond is forever. Uh, they can be things like colors, right? So when I think of insulation, right? So insulation for our houses, I think of pink, right? But that is a trademark of a specific brand of fiberglass. Only Owens Corning can make pink fiberglass insulation, right? Anybody else who makes insulation, they can't make it pink. It has, so that's a trademark of Owen Corning's. It can be sounds, right? So you can register sounds like the MGM lion's roar at the beginning of movies, right? That's a trademark registration is that roar, the actual sound. Uh, it can be shapes or packaging, right? So that Coca-Cola bottle, the shape of that Coca-Cola bottle is a trademark of Coca-Cola, right? So it can be lots of different things. Anything that helps you to say, oh, when I see that, I know it's coming from this company. So trademarks, they require use. So it's a little bit different, right? So patents, if you use it before you file your application, you've lost the ability to get a patent, right? Um, copyrights, again, you don't, you don't have to necessarily have to register it initially, but it's kind of, you know, you can register it and then put it out into the world. Trademarks are kind of the opposite. You can't get any trademark rights until you have use in the marketplace. So it's kind of the reverse of patents in that you have to be out in the marketplace before you get rights to a trademark, whether it's those common law rights I was talking about or to get a state registration or a federal registration, you have to prove to them that you're actually using the mark out in commerce before they will issue that registration to you. And it's based on use in regard to the specific items or services that you're offering underneath that mark, okay? so. The example I always use with clients is Delta. Okay, so Delta, there's a Delta Airlines, there's a Delta Dental Insurance, there's a Delta Faucet Company, and they all have federal, United States federal registrations for the word Delta. And it's because they're all using Delta for different things. And those are able to coexist because they're doing different things. Another thing I wanted to hit on is the strength of trademarks. And this is oftentimes a balancing act between 
marketing on one side that wants to choose marks that really describe the product or the service so that customers know exactly what it is and me on the legal side where <laughs> where something that describes your product is likely not going to be able to be trademarked okay so the strongest trademarks are things that don't describe the goods in any way whatsoever so pepsi kodak exxon those are all the strongest types of marks you can think of um next down is kind of what are suggestive marks so things that kind of suggest what they might be but they don't tell you so an example here is speedy bake is a trademark for frozen dough so frozen dough speedy bake it kind of tells you maybe you might guess what it is but it doesn't actually tell you what it is then we get down to trademarks or potential marks that are what's called merely descriptive of the goods right and so those are not registrable. So if your mark describes what you're selling, you can't register it, right? So Apple computers, right? So Apple can register Apple. That's great because if I think of the brand Apple without knowing who they are, I'm not going to know that they make computers, but they can't register computers because it's describing what they sell. Their, um, their competitors need to be able to say we sell computers too because they do right ibm microsoft they sell computers too so apple can't have an exclusive ownership in a descriptive term so we want to think about that when we're going through that whole branding process is yes we want to come up with a great name but also is that name actually going to be registrable right and so is it descriptive or is it not and if it's not that's great we also want to look at you know, does somebody else have that same mark already or something that's similar? And then would that block us from getting it, right? So the action steps we can take with our businesses in regard to trademarks is A, pick strong marks, pick marks that don't merely describe your goods and then search before you start using, right? So you can search at the trademark office, you can do Google searches, um, I talked about state registrations. You can search the Secretary of State for those. And then you can hire an attorney to do full comprehensive trademark searches, right? So before you start launching, think about doing some serious searching so that you feel safe using that mark. The worst thing that I get with customers, with clients, is when they come in, they've built up a brand, they have an ongoing business that's successful, they've been in business for three years, five years, 10 years. And now all of a sudden they get a cease and desist letter because somebody else has better trademark rights to the name they've been using. And so now they have to stop using, they have to rebrand. It becomes very expensive and difficult to rebrand when you're that far into your business. So it's much better to make sure you're clear to use a mark before you launch with it. I'm not gonna talk too much about trade secrets, but it's kind of the fourth area of intellectual property and it's kind of the opposite of everything else right everything else is out in the public the public sees it trade secrets is predominantly based on state law although there is federal protection available now as well but it's anything that your business gets economic value from by not being generally known to the public or your competitors okay so it has to be something that's secret <laughs> people don't know what it is and that you take reasonable steps to maintain that secrecy, right? So you keep your password secret, you keep hard copies in a locked location, you make it so only, you know, key people at high levels within the company know what the formula is. Uh, anybody you work with, you make sure they have a non-disclosure agreement in place so that anybody who becomes aware of it, they are not able to disclose it. So it only has value while it's a secret. So if someone invents it on their own, comes up with it on their own, that's fine. They're not going to inf infringe your trade secret. If it becomes publicly available, um, not due to any malfeasance, that's fine. They can use it. If they buy your product and they're able to reverse engineer it, that's also fine. That's not a violation of trade secrets. It's only good as so long as you can keep it a secret. Kind of the prime examples are you know, the Coca-Cola formula, KFC's recipe, source code and software. Those are kind of the key examples of trade secrets, right? So had Coca-Cola patented 
their formula back, whatever it was, 100 years ago now at this point, it would have been in the public domain and free for anybody to use and sell for you know 80 some years at this point, right? The fact that they kept it as a trade secret and have done a great job at keeping it a trade secret, that lets it go as long as they're able to keep it a secret. So overall action steps for your businesses, right? In regard to IP. So identify potential IP as early as possible, right? Figure out what it might be and what you might wanna do with it. Address ownership issues. So make sure your employees and your independent contractors have agreements in place that address who owns the IP that they create. Don't use copyrighted material that you don't own or don't have a license to use, right? Clear trademarks before you start using them so that you don't get that cease and desist letter a few years down the road. Register your copyrights and trademarks that are valuable to your company. Apply for patents and apply for them before you make any public disclosure. Keep your trade secrets secret. Make sure you have NDAs in place with all your vendors, consultants, employees to make sure that it stays a secret. Um, then regarding your branding, your marketing, police your brand. So if you have trademarks, it, it's kind of your obligation to see who else is out there and who else might be using your trademarks. If your trademark gets used so broadly, so widely by so many people that customers can no longer figure out who's the actual provider of these goods under this mark, it's, it, you can lose your rights and it can be free for everybody to use. Back in the 80s, Xerox spent millions and millions of dollars telling people to not say Xerox as a verb, right? So they're photocopying something. They're not Xeroxing something because they didn't want Xerox to become so widely used that it meant just photocopiers in general. Google fought over that as well, too, and we're successful. So, you know, I say it all the time. People say it all the time. Let me go Google that, right? Instead of saying, I'm going to go search for that on the Google search platform, right? Uh, nobody says it that way. So there was an issue that maybe Google was going to become genericized and be free for everybody to use, but they were successful that Google is still a trademark exclusive to them. I have some hypotheticals here, you know, when I'm doing this in person where I kind of throw some things out there and say, what do you think? Is this an infringement? And we get, you know, some kind of discussion, probably not going to work here online with the people that we have here but um, they're available. If you wanna see these, I'm sure Front Wave will send out the slides to you. So I'm gonna skip through those. And that's the end of my lecture tonight, right? So this is my contact information available up on the screen if you have any follow-up questions. I know Kellen, you're able to unmute anybody or they can type into the chat if they have any questions before we sign off. But again, thank you everybody for coming tonight and thank you Kellen and Front Wave for letting me talk about one of my passions here tonight. Thank you so much, Ben, for sharing all the knowledge and uh, your years of experience. We truly appreciate it. Um, at this time, if, if anybody would like to unmute and ask Ben a question, please feel free to do so, or you can drop it in the chat. Also in the chat, I've included a link to a brief survey so you can let us know how we're doing. Um, tell us how the uh, workshop went, if you're able to follow along and uh, maybe give us some suggestions for future workshops. Um, but Ben, we truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, some great information there. I know for myself, you know, I have some uh, friends that are creative uh, artists, I guess you could say. I'll be sharing some information with them. Perfect. Um, and it's, it's always good to, you know, know, you know exactly how to keep things legal. And also, uh, you know, so you, at the end of the day, if you're doing something for business, you want to be able to make money off it and protect yourself. So exactly. uh, thank you for sharing that with our members. All right. My pleasure. Anybody have any questions, Dell? I know you're still on. Do you have a question for Ben? If you do, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, or like I said, you can drop it in the chat if you're a, a bit shy and I'll ask Ben, um, you know, from, from that. Ben, one question I do have for you, um, thinking about uh, a friend of mine who, who's a, a singer songwriter, uh, you know, he has some stuff that he's may have written down, uh, he may have recorded on his iPhone, but, you know, doesn't necessarily hasn't post, posted it on YouTube or anything like that that's public. Um, let's say he was singing it for uh, a few friends, 
uh, and uh, somebody you know recorded that or took that and uh, went to Nashville with it. And uh, you know a year later he he hears a song that's very very similar to the one that he wrote on the radio. Um, you know what kind of recourse or what you know what can he do in that situation? Sure, sure, yeah, that comes up all the time, definitely. So yeah. So again, you get you gain copyright rights by creating something and then putting it into tangible form, right? So if your friend had written down the lyrics somewhere, right, right, it wasn't just coming off the top of their head, but they had written down the lyrics, they have copyright protection in those lyrics, right? If they had ever, like you said, you know, recorded it on their iPhone while they were performing it, right? There's copyright rights that are available there. So you could definitely go after someone, you know, copyright infringement requires copying. Okay. So it requires access, right? So copyright law allows for independent creation. So if I created a song or a melody here in California and somebody created that same melody in Florida without ever hearing my version, those two could coexist, right? Because it requires copying. And if they never heard mine, it's called access. They have to have access to your version and then they have to copy it okay so but yes if someone heard their your friend's version and then they went and recorded it then yes that would be a copyright infringement all right and that comes up all the time right so there's you see it on the news right so these you know these big hits that you hear on the radio and they're they're getting sued by you know, a musician from the 70s who said, hey, that's that's my song that I wrote back, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Right. Um, and this big dollars at issue here. And so that's the big fight is it comes down to typically is proving access. Right. So proving that the new artist heard that previous song and then chose to copy it. Right. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Another question I had with, with um, cop pertaining to copyrights. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll see older books be available for uh, free download or, or I'm thinking a lot of audio books will have free recordings of uh, books. Is it something like 50 or 100 years old or something like that? I know you said it was different now with the life of the author plus 70 years, but do those pre-19, was it 1973? Right, so that's when, that, that's when the law got extended to that length and time. So there were copyrights before, they just had shorter time frames, right? So when we get before 78, 73 and 78, it gets very complicated as to when things are expiring, okay? Because they did have notice requirements back then. They did have registration requirements back then. So you could have lost your copyright by not following those formalities, which would not happen now. And they had different lengths, right? And so if they, were, if they expired before 73, 78, then they were expired and they weren't extended. If they survived into 73, 78, then they would get extended further on, right? So it's kind of, it has to be analyzed almost on a work by work basis. Um, but yes, anything, you know, before early 1900s, you're pretty safe is going to be public domain for sure. But after that, it would kind of have to be looked at on a work by work basis. Terrific. Thank you, Ben. Can you think of, can you think of anything else that's like a, um, maybe emerging uh, issue in in IP and patent development and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton. It's a very active field. I mean, kind of the hot thing right now for everybody is, you know, it's blockchain and NFTs, right? And how those are protected, right? Because they usually, the NFTs are tied into some item that is, you know, typically would be a copyrighted item, right? And so that's kind of a hot thing right now is how do we, protect the, the ownership of these NFTs and how do we, we protect the creators? Because a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, these NFTs are basically stealing other artists' copyrights, right? They're taking, it's not the creator of that piece of artwork that's creating the NFT, it's somebody else who doesn't have the rights to it, right? So that's kind of a interesting area that's gonna be, you know, determined over this next decade or so. Definitely see some, uh litigation you know down the coming down the road for that definitely, but definitely. i can see what you're saying well thank you so much ben i appreciate you being on i know we appreciate it at front wave you have a great evening and uh, we'll see you next time for uh state planning sounds good take care kellen you as well